blended family. We are a 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 blended family. And we are a blended family. So this is Blended Families, week seven of twelve. This is where we start getting into step parenting skills. I like to call this the blessings. Next week, it's more like the dark side. So uh, this is a lot of the good stuff that can happen being a step parent, or any parent for that matter, but especially step parents because it's tougher. you got to be tougher to be a step parent. Um, so I like to start out because a lot of people think blended families are not biblical. I hear that every now and then. But uh, we have some pretty good examples of biblical step parents, and I like to bring up a few of those. Obviously, the probably the best example of a step parent would be Joseph, the husband of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Right? Joseph was not Jesus's biological father. He was a stepdad. He he did the work to raise, help raise him. So that's probably one of the best ones. Another fairly well-known one is Mordecai. You find him in the book of Esther. Uh, Esther's parents uh, were killed, and he was her uncle, but he stepped up to be her stepdad and helped raise her the rest of the way until she was chosen to be one of the contestants in the queen... Uh, choosing <laughs> later, yeah. whatever you would call that. Bachelorette. Yeah. The, like the bachelorette. The bachelorette. Uh, so Morde- we have Joseph, we have Mordecai, and then we have Pharaoh's daughter. Egypt has talent. Okay, Pharaoh's daughter uh, was down by the river, and one of her maids found this basket with a baby in it in the river, right? So she took him out and raised that boy as her own. And she named him Moses because he came out of the water. That's kind of where that name came from. So one way to look at that is Moses' mother sent him down the river. To save him. Because they were killing the boys. Well, yeah, I mean, there was a good reason for it, right? They were killing all the firstborns because they knew the prophecy, and so they wanted to make sure that never came true. But Moses' biological mother, he was like three or four months old or something like that. She put him in that basket and sent him just trusting God that something good would happen, and it did. And so he spent like 40 years being an Egyptian, and then he spent 40 years in the wilderness, and then he spent 40 years getting the people out of Egypt. Um, one of the things I like to do in this lesson is make a comparison between mother and father and mom and dad. When I was growing up, it was mom and dad, right? Mother and father just seemed very formal to me for some reason. I mean, that they asked me to call them mom and dad, so that's what I did. But just for purposes of the class, mother and father are the biological parents. And because we're dealing with blended families and step parents, a lot of times mom and dad are the people that are doing the work. So obviously there's a lot of biologicals out there that don't do any of the work. And there's a lot of step parents that do all the work. So to me, mom and dad are the, the parents that are raising the kid. Right? They're the ones that are putting in the time, the effort, and the work to raise them up in the way they should go. Okay. This little tidbit right here is kind of one of those things that, especially in blended families, we talk about it when we talk about the pyramid all the time. 
the single parents that come together for a new blended family, one of the biggest mistakes they make is that they feel like they own their children. So when they come together, it's my kid versus your kid in most cases, right? But we have to get our thinking changed around that we understand all children are a gift from God. Yours, mine, ours, it doesn't matter. They're all gifts from God. God has given us kids to be stewards of. Okay? Now, I missed a spot here. Children are a gift from God. So is your spouse. All right? For us guys, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. All right? So even a spouse is a gift. God wants his kids back because we're supposed to be good stewards. You can keep your spouse. It does not say that, Larry. You say that. <laughs> well, I can back it up. No, you can't. Yeah, I can. Uh, think of Job. I always go back to Job. Uh, Satan was talking to God, you know, and God's like, hey, what do you think of Job down there? And uh, so, yeah, well, yeah, he's doing really good, but you keep him protected. I can't touch him. So, okay, well, I'll take my hands off. Just do whatever, whatever you want to do, just don't kill him. So he wiped out all his property. He even wiped out his kids. He did not take his wife. Well, that's part of punishing him. Could be. <laughs> Maybe that's why. <laughs> the devil the devil knew, right? But no, see, God returned double. You know, he had twice the livestock, twice the property. He got another ten kids. But now he's got ten kids in heaven and he's got ten kids here, so he's got twenty altogether. He still only had the one wife. So you can keep your spouse. Because <laughs> he gave him a hard time. Yeah. yeah, it's true. That's very true. Yeah. That was part of the punishment, right? <laughs> so, right. That is. <laughs> it sounds reassuring when you say it. <laughs> okay. But marriage is all about using God's word. To overcome those challenges. Okay. Um, especially in blended families, there has to be one set of rules for the house. Carol had experience with yours, mine, and ours. Different rules for all categories. Kids from before, one set of rules. Kids that you brought in, a different set of rules. Ours, a different set of rules. It's our house, our rules. Now, parenting is where the rules come in, right? When a, a married couple is in agreement on the parenting, they have power and authority to do the parenting, right? When there's disagreement, now it's like the inmates are running the asylum because you're in disagreement, so the kids are kind of doing whatever they want to do. And they're telling you what they're going to do a lot of times, right, which is not good. But there has to be one set of rules, and <clears throat> that one set of rules should be the Word of God. You know, in one of the other chapters we talked about who's normal is normal. All right? Well, you have a normal, I got one. We come together, and it's, it's not about whose normal is correct. We need to come together and create a godly normal. Amen. That's, the, that's what makes blended families work, is when my normal and your normal become, like we do in the pyramid here, more godly. So... Again, we're not owners, we're stewards. God wants his kids back because when the kids become adults, they're on their own. They need to be on their own because they have to answer to God at that point. 
They don't answer to you. They have to answer to God. Um, blended families, you know, the, the age of the kids makes a big difference. Generally, the younger the kids, the more likely they are to blend. When they're like single digits, they're, the tendency is to want to be part of this new thing. But when you get closer to the teens and into the teens, it's like they want to be themselves. They don't want to be you or part of you. <laughs> they want to be themselves. So when you get into the teens, obviously, it's going to be a lot tougher. But even the younger ones will test you. I heard a while back that even at, at, by, the, by the age of three, a kid knows who's in charge, you or them. <laughs> So you got to get them early. <laughs> Otherwise, they're going to be telling you what to do. Okay, so under 12, 10, and obviously there's always exceptions to the rule, but the tendency is the, the younger they are, the easier they will become part of this new blended family. Um, but you have to be ready for what they're going to try to do. It's just part of their nature. Kids rebel. So they will test you. They will try to come between you. And that's why you need to be in agreement. You know, our house, our rules, we're one. There's, there's no room in the middle here. you got to be one because that divided house isn't going to stand very long. And it's usually the kids they come in and divide. Mm -hmm. Karen? Yeah, you know, children are very savvy. And, you know, we talk about people looking for loopholes. Kids will find a loophole every time they go through that loophole. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. Yeah, they, well, you didn't exactly say it that way, right? I mean, they, they'll take it, it's, to them, it's the letter of the law. Yeah. Not the spirit of the law, right, or the intent, mm -hmm. uh, which, I mean, that's what lawyers do, right? They try to figure out, okay, well, it, there wasn't a certain word in the sentence here, so that kind of leaves this out. I mean, they get down to the, the letter of the law versus what it was intended for. Mm -hmm. That's why when you become a new blended family, we suggest you have a family meeting, even with the older kids that are out of the house. And uh, you and your spouse decide what the rules are going to be, what the consequences are going to be, write up copies. So when you have this meeting and you deliver this information to the kids, they sign it. And they're to keep their copy wherever. But they can't come out and say, well, they can, they can say, well, I didn't know that was a rule. Well, you just pull the paper out. Well, you signed it. You did know that was a rule because they will play that game. But if you have them sign what these are the rules and these are the consequences, you knew it ahead of time. There's no room for uh, trying to argue. It's right there in black and white. But um, you guys have to have that one unity and deliver that to the kids. You and one says, well, I'll tell my kids and he will tell his kids. No, you have have to show the unity. You cannot show a division at all. You are all now one family. It's now our set of rules. So you have to deliver it together, and they have to know, you know, well, if um, the stepmom is home and, and his kid does something wrong, that the same rule is going to apply whether he's there or not. And you kind of, as a parent, have to know yourself. He's going to follow through with what we decided, not pull something else as a as a new rule you guys have to trust one another to do what you guys have decided the rules and the consequences are going to be you have to have that agreement and the trust between yourselves and the kids will feel that but if there is like Karen said if there is a loophole in any way they will try to go through it not all of them but they will normally try. Most of them. And what we suggest also is tell them 
one night a week or one afternoon a week, we're going to do something as a family because you are trying to incorporate a new family. This is our new family. We have new rules. We're all going to be one, whether it be um, rent a red box movie and pop popcorn or all go to McDonald's or just do a game night, whatever. And I know some of them say, well, I'm too old for that. I don't want to do that. But let me tell you, because I can speak from experience, five to ten years down the road, they're going to say, well, you know what? We have game night at our house because that's what you started in my head a while ago. So we, we do that. So however they're resisting now, you're laying a pattern for them to make it a good pattern. Make it something that they will feel like part of it. Or do a family meal. Okay, if you want tacos tonight, then you cut the, the lettuce or you set the table. Whatever. Make them be part of it. Include them. Yep. And just to kind of reinforce the, uh, the pyramid here, one of the biggest reasons that blended families... You need to bring that over here. They can't see that. Okay, I can do that. One of the biggest reasons that blended families fail quicker and more often is because of the parenting, the disagreement on how to parent the other person's kids, right? Like we were saying, if, if the marriage is not put up high enough above the kids, then there's going to be disagreement all over the place, and there's going to be so much strife, stress, tension going on because you don't trust the other person to deal with your kids and all those kind of things. Most people just say it's not worth it. But it's because they don't get the marriage right. When you get the marriage right, the parenting gets a lot easier because you're 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 the one flesh that you're supposed to be. Now you have the power and authority that God gives you. He, he gives you the responsibility to train them up in the way they should go. So you have to show them. You have to be it, right? Be it before you try to sell it. Okay, um, moving over to this side a little bit. Okay, a couple of, well, three different uh, categories here. We have a whole bunch of scriptures. I didn't write them all out because there's just not enough room on the board here. But we have the blessings of being a parent, and that counts being a step parent. Uh, the parental duties, and the legacy. Right Now, one of the things that a husband and wife are supposed to do is show their kids how to do marriage. Because that's what God really wants. He wants godly offspring. He's all about the generations. So he wants godly offspring that keep things going. Right? But uh, there's, there's a whole lot of blessings. And one of those things that is important for step parents is to have the proper attitude about what you are and who you are, right? If you're just a guy that's married to the kid's mom or dad, then that's a little off, right? You have to see yourself as someone that can have a very positive influence in, in one of God's kids, even though you're not the mother or the father, the biological, you can be the mom or dad, or at least a mentor. For me, I didn't exactly see myself as a, a father because of the age differences and different things like that, but I definitely could see myself as a mentor and a positive influence. So that's kind of where I went. Uh, I took it upon myself to figure out how I could relate to them, find something they were interested in, and not just, well, you figure out how to relate to me. I'm the new guy. I'm the husband here. I'm the man of the house. You figure it out. I, I 
try to figure out how I could relate to them. So it, it, it kind of goes both ways there. Okay. Um, so we start off with Psalms 127.3. Children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So children are a gift. They're a reward. It's a blessing of being in a relationship with God, right? Um, like I said, next week we talked more about the dark side. So we'll, I mean, this is the blessing, but next week it's the dark side. Sometimes kids are a pain in the butt, okay? It's just the way it is. It's part of the spiritual warfare. Well, it's part of them growing up, Larry. You know, well, yeah, them it's break, part of that. Coming into you know, puberty. It's part of the challenge. Trying to figure out who they are. <laughs> yeah. They're new in the world and they're new. Yeah. So, <clears throat> spiritual warfare is a test. Okay. So, and life in general, marriage in particular, parenting is spiritual warfare. We're not bomb parents. I mean, we make mistakes too. Yeah, yeah. we got to learn. Yeah. Right? Uh, Proverbs 23, 24. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begets a wise child shall have joy of him. Okay? So, when you've done a good job of raising up the child in the way he should go, God blesses you, and you will have a wise child that you can be proud of. The opposite is also true. If you do a lousy job, you're going to have regrets later. Um, 2011, even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. So back when I was growing up, we could pretty much run around the neighborhood. There was very few fences anywhere. I lived out in the country, so people didn't really care if you walked across their yard, you know, those kind of things. But everybody knew who you were, and they knew what you did. <laughs> and they had no problem telling your folks if you were doing something you weren't supposed to. That grapevine worked really well. So everybody knew whose kid was who, and they kind of knew the parents because of what the kids did. But they also knew if the parents were doing a good job, they knew the kid was a good kid. You so, mean they had Google Maps? Yeah. That was just starting. <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, 17.6, children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. What we see a lot today is fathers are nowhere to be found. Um, the best way to kill a snake is cut its head off, right? Satan wants to kill the family, so he's trying to cut the head off getting the fathers taken out. Uh, a lot of what we see in culture, uh, you know, we, we have you know the feminist movement, Every, everything is anti-male, it seems like, especially head of household, man of the house, prophet, priest, and king, and all those kind of things. That's like, ooh, bad. But that's what God expects. That's the way he set it up. It works. That works pretty well. But um, it says, children's children, okay, so grandkids, are the crown of old men. And the glory of children are their fathers. So I'm pretty proud of my grandson. He's got a nice business going. He's doing very well. Even the younger, his younger brother. Uh, the two little ones, they're cute as all get out. But five years old, he was in his first race for the school, raising money for the school, and he did 35 laps yeah. around the school, and a couple of, uh, well, our daughter, the other, other daughter, his aunt, and a couple of friends said a dollar a lap. 
never thinking Nathan would do 35 <laughs> laps. He did 35 laps around until he's five years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> so so <laughs> it's it's cool being a grandparent because you can spoil the grandkids and then give them back to the parents, right? Oh, no, you got to give them 10 pounds of sugar and then give them back. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Here, have some ice cream, a couple of candy bars, you know, then, oh, yeah, yeah. Get, time to go home. Yeah, the mom's gone. Don't give her any more candy. Okay, I won't. Yeah, not anymore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But the other part of that, okay, it's... It's awesome to have grandkids because that's kind of your glory. But the kids themselves, it's their dad that is their glory or infamy sometimes. Um, If they have a great dad, they can be very proud of him. They identify. They get their identity that way. But they also get a bad identity, identity, identity if the father is nowhere to be found or incarcerated or, you know, whatever. Not a good parent. Drug addict. Just a bad parent. Mean, nasty, you know, all those kind of things. That's not much of a glory. So we got to be careful with that. The boy name says... <laughs> right. Uh, uh, there's a lot in a name, right? Okay. Parental duties. A whole bunch of them. Mostly, well, all of these happen to be in Proverbs. The best one, or not the best one, but one of the most important is 22.6. That's where it says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Okay, train up a child in the way he should go, not the way you think he should go, but in the way he should go. And when he's old, he won't depart from it. So there's like, when he's young, he'll probably depart from it. But then when he's old, he's like, oh, man, I really messed up. I need to get back to God. Uh, that was kind of like me, I guess. I totally separated myself from anything godly for, like, from high school till I was 50. And I was like, I better get back. Yeah. <laughs> I need to come back. Okay. But in, the, in between, it was all bad stuff. Okay. 20 to 15, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Okay. Children are born foolish. They're born that way. Okay. It's not like they're born nice and they learn bad stuff. They're born bad. And we have to teach them how to be good. If being good is not normal. Well, we're all born that way. Yeah, everybody. Yeah. So you can, now one of the hard things one of the hard things about this is the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Okay? If you try to spank a kid today, they call CPS on you. (laughs) So it's very difficult to do the way it was put in the scripture here. Um, 23.13 is kind of the same thing. Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Okay. Yeah. I just heard somebody the other day I was talking to, and she said, um, as a grandmother, she told it. She said, I'm going to beat you so that the police doesn't. That's right. Oh. Because I know when to stop. Ah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, in my house growing up, we had the Board of Education. <laughs> and it had holes in it, you know, about that long. <laughs> but... My mom was a teacher. My dad was a, a pretty decent guy. But whenever I got in trouble, usually my mom would be the one that would catch me. And I'd be sent to my room, and it'd be, wait till your father gets home. <laughs> and I'd sit there on the bed, looking out the window for like three hours, <laughs> waiting for him to come home from work. And I'm fretting the whole time. It was the waiting that was bad. Right? But the best thing I learned from all that is they were one. I was never going to talk my mom out of getting lax 
<laughs> you know, it was she was the one that would put me in the dungeon, so to speak. But it was my dad that executed the punishment. But they were always, usually it was in, they'd be sitting on the bed and I'd be over somebody's knee and or my dad's knee and then whack, you know, maybe two or three times. But he would always lie to me first and say, this is going to hurt me more than you. <laughs> the biggest lie our parents told us. Yeah. You know, and I thought, oh man, you must really be hurting. Because <laughs> that's hurt. That hurt. But they always did it because they cared. They did it because they loved me enough to correct me. And they never did it in anger. Right. They, they never... I mean, they, they, yeah. <laughs> sometimes they, it was a good thing it took a while to get it taken care of because if they did it when they were angry, it would have been a whole lot worse. So they were very good about making it just... Okay, we hate to do this, but because of what you did, we have to do this. Because we don't want you to keep doing that. Yeah. It's trying to reconnect. Oh. Is it still broadcasting? Uh, well, that's fine. Yeah, it, it does that a lot. Because we missed kind of like the last minute, and it's still trying to reconnect. Yeah, well, it's, it is what it is. The audio will be good. Um... I, I, it splits it sometimes. Uh, okay, so Proverbs 4.1, Hear ye, children, the instruction of a father. We hope you're enjoying today's Blended Families Ministry show. Please check out our resources on our website at blendedfamiliesministry.org. Also, if this program blesses you in some way, it would be a huge blessing to us if you would also consider a small donation or even become a monthly partner with us. No donation is too small. And attend to no understanding. So... It's important for especially the fathers to instruct the children and try to give them understanding of what they're talking about. You know, again, our house, our rules, the father should be instructing what the rules are. This is why they are. Kids would rather hear why something is than just because I said so. Give them the why so that they understand the reason for whatever the rule is. Uh, Proverbs 5, 7. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. So this is God speaking to his kids. It is important to listen to me. I'm trying to protect you. There, Sometimes there's like, we have a set of rules. And there's, there's freedom in here. There's consequences out here. God sets the boundaries to give us freedom within the boundaries. And Satan wants us to keep stepping outside the lines... Because it looks good, it smells good, it looks like fun. And then we try it, and it's like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble now. So you have to go through the whole process of getting forgiveness, repent, confess, and all that kind of stuff to be able to get back inside the box. So we need to listen and do not depart from the words. Uh, 724 is pretty much the same thing uh, listen to me and uh, obey the words uh, 832 similar slightly different listen for blessed are they that keep my ways okay those are the parental duties you know it's it, God was pretty pretty heavy on the parents responsibilities of teaching their children about him and that's what we're supposed to do as parents uh, you know the, again the, the husband is supposed to be the prophet priest and king he's supposed to be speaking the word providing spiritual covering and enforcing the rules okay 
The legacy. What are we leaving behind? Um, one of those things I think we all kind of hope to hear one day is, well done, good and faithful servant. When we get to heaven, hopefully that's what we hear. Hopefully we don't hear, boy, he just made it. <laughs> you know, it's about serving, being the servant, doing well and doing the good works because you are grateful for what God has done for you. Proverbs 20, verse 7, A just man walks in his integrity, and his children are blessed after him. So when, for, for those that are godly men, godly fathers, godly husbands, they raise up the child in the way they should go. And he is full of integrity. He does what he says he's going to do. That's a blessing to his children. Because he has a good reputation in the community. And the children are blessed because of that. Uh, Proverbs 13, 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his grandchildren, his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So the way things are these days, it's, it's tough to even leave an inheritance for your own kids, let alone your grandkids. But because of divorce... That's a big reason. When there's a divorce, it splits up whatever assets the couple had, right? So that divides whatever inheritance the children might have gotten. So because there's so much divorce, there's a very small inheritance that's being passed on. Um, okay, Proverbs 31:28. and this is for all the moms. Her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. That's when she is the godly woman and godly wife, it says in Proverbs 31. Uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that that godly wife does. She's not just sitting on the couch eating bonbons. She's got her own little business going. She's bringing money into the home and is very productive, fruitful, and all that, as well as being the, the mom and the wife and everything else. Um, Proverbs 10.1, A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. And right now that's kind of personal to us. He's... Uh, He's not being real wise at the moment. So it's, I feel bad, but it's really hard for her. Okay. 10-7, the memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Okay, when you've been a good parent, a good husband, or a good spouse, and you've raised up godly offspring, those generations keep producing good fruit. There was some kind of a, a study some years ago about two different families, uh, probably 100 years ago by now, but one, there was a whole bunch of doctors, lawyers, congressmen, senators, and all that kind of stuff in the family, and there were like 300 and some people in that family tree. And they looked at another one that was ungodly. Most everybody was a crook, a prostitute, whatever, drunkard, all those kind of things. Most of them were in jail and uh, very little, if any, good fruit, and there was maybe a hundred people. So the good, quote, family, you know, had like three times as many offspring because they were blessed. And the other one, most of them, it was just a name that nobody wanted to care about. So a good name... It's a good thing. Larry? Yeah. When you talked about integrity and community, um, our days, depending on which community you're in, integrity is not anymore a yardstick that that's a good family. 
we look at what car is parked in the highway, or I'm sorry, driveway. in the uh, driveway, and you know how the kids are dressed and how many toys they have, right. and that's a good family. And maybe inside, everybody is just in their rooms, on their phones, and there is no bonding. Mm -hmm. right. So integrity has to be the same as it was in the Bible today, despite of what we see around us, because the community is not setting my standard of integrity. Mm -hmm. And I'm not coming against what you're saying. I'm just trying to be yeah. more well, different 2017, right. where I know a lot of families that are very integer, you know, man, uh, husband and wife, but they live in communities where people have so much money that they don't care about integrity. They don't care about honor. They don't even care about the Bible. Oh, so so if, if you're coming with that standard towards their standard, you look like a bleep bleep. So just wanted to mention that. Yeah. Right, it's true. Uh, integrity is not all that easy to find anymore. It's more about status. Right? Um, let's see, the last one. Proverbs 3.35, The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. So, again, a good name is a good thing. And God has, has a way of lifting up those who keep their vertical in good shape. But that shame that goes with sin ends up, you know, that, that name is going to rot eventually. That, that family tree will die. So, um, okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Timing just about right here. Okay. As we talk about in the pyramid over there, at some point, children become adults. Okay? You've raised them up in the way they should go. It's time to give them back to God. They become, you know, whatever age, 18 to 20 something, these days, 30 something. <laughs> They become, they need to become adults, right? Part of being a good parent and training them up in the way they should go is making them independent and not dependent. So children become adults. Your relationship has to change. You have to treat them as an adult, not just a kid, okay? They make their own choices. They have to live by them. You know, one of those old sayings is, you made your bed, you sleep in it. Right? So at, at some point, you have to allow your kids to be adults and be responsible for their own decisions. And, again, that's kind of where we're at right now in our own own life, we have an adult who for, for many years has not really been responsible. Uh, so, you know, we had to do some things. And again, this is kind of personal. You, you can't prevent them from falling. This is the hardest thing about being a parent. You want to catch them. You see them falling, you want to catch them before they hit the ground. You don't want them to hurt. You don't want them to suffer. You know what it's like when you do that, and you don't want them to have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But the lessons are learned in the trials. Amen. Mm -hmm. You don't really learn that much when you're winning. It's all good. It's when you lose, you have to kind of take inventory to figure out, how do I win? Mm -hmm. Right? God's a winner. Amen. He's not a loser. He is victorious, always has been. God has never lost, ever, and never will. But in, in blended families especially, it gets tougher because, you know, somebody is dealing with someone else's kid. It's, it's tough to get the head wrapped around, okay, this is, this is God's kid. He's not really mine. He's not really yours. We've got to... You know, give them to God and let them fall if they have to. So it, it can be pretty tough. And 
I know we had some issues even when we were just writing this. We, we were kind of in this same spot. There's something about this chapter. I don't know what it is. Well, and it's the same kid. Same kid. You know, it's just uh, part of that spiritual warfare, I guess. Yeah. But he was going through some stuff, and we were like, well, we got to let you fall and deal with it. And then things came back the next day. And, oh, my God, we got we to gotta help him, you know, that kind of thing. So it's when you're the parent, it's really hard. I would say that is probably the hardest thing to do is let your kid fall on their face and then, I mean, you got to let them fall on their face and then you got to let them get up. Mm-hmm. Picking them up is not that good either. But that's what we want to do because we're the parent, right? want to fix it all the time. <laughs> want to fix it all the time. Yeah, that's what we do as parents. We fix things. Yeah, yeah. but it goes back to what you said. We're stewards. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we can't do God's job for them. Right. right. God is their parent, their true parent. Mm-hmm. And I had to learn that lesson in my relationship because I kept trying to be that safety net. And I remember, you know, you pray and you're interceding. Don't get me wrong, you should do all that. Right. But you're not seeing you're, you're not seeing some of the, the, the turnaround. Mm-hmm. And it's almost like the Lord was saying, well, I would do something if you would get out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, okay, Lord, I'll get out of the way. Let you handle this. Right. Yeah. And, you know, some people just have to fall pretty far mm-hmm. before they realize where they are you know but trust that God's love for them is greater than our love for them yeah and that's that's where it's a test of our faith yes to trust him to be the heavenly father that he is exactly and you know Larry the um, the last sentence it's also personal to me um, I learned to ask my son you know are you listening to what I, what I'm saying because you know, you can give hundreds of good advices, and their mind is on some whatever video game, and they're just blocking you. Mm-hmm. And you just lost 15 minutes thinking you're doing excellent <laughs> teaching. Right. So I always make sure when I talk to him, are you listening? Do you, you want to hear what I have to say? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Exactly. <laughs> because, you know, it's you can talk and talk and talk. And one time I thought, I, I was just coming from one of the classes here, and I, I just poured out what you poured in. And he said, oh, that was so awesome. I saw a video. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I just told you what I And you saw a video? He saw a video that talked to him more than I talked to him. So, But it was not because I didn't talk to him. It was because he didn't listen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, in in the communication. It's always make sure somebody's listening before you start talking. Otherwise, you're just moving your lips. And you're talking the wall. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the wall answers you back. <laughs> That's called an echo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, like that. Um, I just keep talking and talking. <laughs> Some of it sticks. Some of it gets in, but you never know how much or which part. Yeah. My son usually goes, yes, Mom, I get it. <laughs> so I ask them, am I talking to myself? And they look at me like, okay, I guess I am. <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
children are a blessing, mm-hmm. even if they're not acting like it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I had to look at that scripture and say, I'm choosing to believe the Bible over the actions of this child. Right. Yeah. It's really the child is from a broken home and has the baggage, and mm-hmm. you know, there's got to be that grace for the child and train them up in the way they should go. When they're older, they won't depart. So, okay, there's going to come a day where this child is going to be okay. have a head on straight, following God, mm-hmm. and we've been seeing that with our children as they're getting older. And um, and so it's it's, it's a process. Yeah. It's tough, yeah. but uh, yeah. And then the, of course the the uh, pyramid. pyramid um, <laughs> got to have that relationship with God and the husband and wife have, I mean, those two have to be intact. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so I don't want to start calling my kids. Listen, here, you little blessing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speaking into it, dig right now. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, Wayne? It's, uh, in this lesson, it's very easy to define step as being an important definition. But when you have your family meeting, and you're addressing your children to emphasize to them that you are our children and to never use the word step when you introduce them, when you refer to them, or anything, because there's there's a connotation in the word step that's demeaning. And if you can eliminate all of that process in your children's mind, you will take great steps forward in creating a unity in your family. Mm -hmm. Good word. Yeah, and the rules are the same. If the rules are the same, that helps. Mm -hmm. There's no difference. The rules are for our family, not for one or the other. Awesome. Constance? So to touch on that, um, between the four and six-year-old, it's kind of hard to put out rules and have them sign it because they're four and six. Well, they can put them on. And print it. They can make an X. They're really not going to understand it. You know what I mean? But, and also, to touch on the step-parent thing, like, we're trying to do that and letting them know, like, once we're married, you know, you're going to have a bonus mommy, all that extra stuff. Mm-hmm. And other mom is saying, that's your step-mom. She's not your mom. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, like, how do you... Our house, our rules. You just yeah. sort of ignore it and yeah. go on with your principles and make that a definition in your family. Mm-hmm. You will get that step input from all over the world. Right. You're never going to avoid it except in your family. Mm-hmm. Make it your, our children, your blessed, blessed parents or your blessed grandparents, bonus grandparents, whatever it is, but avoid it in all costs in your family, but you'll never avoid the worldly input of Somebody step. Somebody putting well, the she's label. She's your stepmom, mm-hmm. or she right. is your step. So I just tell her that, do I tell her that's true, or do I Our tell house, her? our she, rules. She says it to our me. house, our <laughs> rules. If you, you know, whatever you refer in your house, fine, but in our house, this is the way it is. Okay. Mm-hmm. Our house, our rules. You tell them you're going to hear a lot of people refer to it that way, and that's the way the world talks, and that's fine, but we're under God, and we have a different... Yeah, in our and house, our this is what we do. live like we're under God, and, and do that light. And some, some of that will depend on how you relate Reinforce to them, it. and yeah. how, how you talk to each other about that kind of stuff. But I like... Wayne is like the expert yeah. on, this, on this stuff. But we, there was another couple. 40 like, years. You know, you know, the main thing is, and let me speak, because, you know, the main thing was, I knew he loved me. Because he's a stepchild. Like, just Some like don't know that. the biological daughters he had. That's the key. That the child knows you love him, and that, that the child knows you guys are one, one, mm-hmm. and that and there's there's peace that gives the child security, and you know another thing, and this is, you know, you know you're praying for that the other mom, mm-hmm. and 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 they know that there's no because they they might be hearing bad stuff, right? They're talking about you. But you're only speaking good. Right. You know, it's one out of a thousand things. That's what you're speaking. That, that's the key. You, loving the child, and, and, and that's how you're going to get a, a good child. Absolutely. What do we call her? Right. When we're talking about her, like to my kids, what would we say? Mommy, your other mommy, mommy, Renee, or. No, you or, can say your mom. Your mom? Yeah. And just in context, know. they'll know which your mom I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Your white mom? You know, it's tough. It's a, it's a, it would be clear. I mean, I just... You do not say 
say that. <laughs> what? Said, what? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> no, didn't. She's the non GMO mom. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> She's healthy. Oh, good. Whoa, Sarah. okay. I just wanted to kind of um, emphasize what he just said on making sure you honor the parent, the biological parent, because it, it will end up backfiring. Right. If you say anything disrespectful or negative, of course. you can find something good mm -hmm. to say and. Technically, that is their mom. Biology. And it's always going to be. That's yeah. not going to so change. So you just want to make sure that, because it always backfires. Sure. And yeah. in the heat of the moment, our emotions. Right. You might be tempted, but. Yeah. And when the kid gets older, they'll figure it out themselves, whatever way they want to figure it out. It's not up to us to try to influence good or bad. We just do, in our home, what we're supposed to do and make sure they know this is our new family. This is this is how it's going to be from here on out. Um, it is a process, though. It does not happen overnight. But here is a, a good product here. They've been, well, Wayne has known uh, Austin for 40 years, and Wayne and his wife, Diana, which is Austin's mom, 38 years they just celebrated being married. So this perfect blended family is the way it should be done. Was it easy? No. Uh, is everything finished and grandkids and all that? This, you know, er, life every day is a challenge. Every Amen. day is a challenge. So every day is a new day, and we're going to have to end it up here. But go ahead, Wayne. Let me share with you as I just was alerted yesterday in uh, the Beyond Divorce classes. It was my habit nearly 40 years ago to have every, everyday prayer of putting on the full armor of God. And recognizing that your blended family is severe spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. What I recognized yesterday is that I prayed this daily for years and years and years, mm -hmm. and we skirted by many of these spiritual attacks in our family and not enlightened until yesterday. That was, that was my faith in doing it daily years ago, and all of these negative things didn't happen, and that's faith in God and the result of prayer, and you will need it. So Step put one. on the full armor of God daily, and you will avoid many, many, many of these attacks. All right. Very good. And guys, level one. you're the one that's supposed to go to the armory right. to put on the armor of God. And when you go in there, in that room with all the, the swords and the shields and the helmets and, and all that, get the biggest shield you can carry. Amen. Because whoever's behind you needs protection. Mm -hmm. I got you. I so, want to say something real quick and then we got to end this. No? I'm good. For anybody else? T boy, do you want something? Okay. I was saying okay. Amen. Amen. Karen? Karen? And on this topic, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're having this teaching because the world teaches us the negativity of self parenting. Right. Especially yeah. coming out of um, this, you know, like Disney World or whatever they. Oh, yeah. The wicked stepmom. Yeah, they always have the yeah, uh, stepmom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to realize if we have an understanding that we are ourselves adopted into the family of God. Right. There you go. And how God treats us as his adopted children, mm -hmm. then, you know, we can ask his help, his grace to live things out his way. And right. he can give us the grace to, mm -hmm. to walk in this. Absolutely. Amen. That's a good place to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're all adopted, okay? Yeah, we are. Mm -hmm. God's kingdom. That's, and the one thing about back in the old Roman days, when you were adopted, you had all the rights as a real child, biological, and you could not be unadopted. Right. <laughs> so if somebody adopted a slave, they were family and they had all the same rights and privileges as a regular family member, and there was no way to undo it. So there's no way to undo the adoption that God gives us. Amen. Amen. Yes, another wonderful class with Drs. Larry and Carol Snap, Blended Families Ministry in Phoenix, Arizona, coming to you each and every week from Dream City Church and broadcasted right here on ChristianLivingRadio.com with me, Pastor G. May God's best be yours. We'll see you next week.